awesome. Well, how good is it to be in church today? Kids have a fantastic time and, and so good. And I just want to mention, uh, just before we sit down, just, just want to endorse uh, what a great promo that is for our conference. And I believe that promo gives us a feel of how great it's going to be. And I, I really want to encourage you. I want to ask you, uh, like, book into that conference and come to all of it. You know, the whole weekend. We planned it for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And, uh, of course, the charge is just for Friday and Saturday. And to help us get those speakers, Rob Wall, who's traveling all over the world, Per Johan Strenstrand, who's coming from Sweden. And uh, these are great guys. You've had Rob, you've not had Per, but he'll be a new friend for you, and you'll love him too. And uh, I just really encourage you. I believe that these are great times in the life of church for God to do something in us. So, you know, in Sheffield, in Derby, in Sutton, please find yourselves booking in, get involved in that conference. Let's just uh, have an incredible weekend together. A holy weekend where God meets with his people, Icon Church. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's, uh, yeah, take our seats. And uh, turn, uh, we're going to turn to God's word this, this morning. I, first of all, I just want to welcome, if you're here for the first time, I want to welcome you. I also want to welcome Sheffield, who are with us, Darby, who I'm going to be sharing this message with too, and Sutton today uh, are going to hear this message. And we're starting a new series called This Is Us. And the whole purpose of that series is for us to be confident, both as individuals but also as a church, in who God has called us to be. And I think that's one thing that our conference speaks into, gives us that confidence of the kingdom culture that we're going to embrace. That we're not just going to be people who embrace the culture of our world, but we'll be people who embrace the culture of God's kingdom. So our title is This Is Us, and over the next few weeks, several, several weeks, where we're going to be dropping in with these messages about This Is Us, called, and with the theme, Dreamers, Builders, Pioneers. And so I want to start this morning really with a, a story from Genesis. Genesis chapter 37. I'm going to read verses 1 to 11. It's the story of Joseph. It's one of the most famous stories in the Bible, and I'd uh, encourage you to read it. I'm just going to read a few verses, just um, about 11 verses this morning, and, and refer a little bit to them. But this story goes on for about another you know, 15 chapters or so, or something like that. And so it's just an incredible story. The story of Joseph. So let me read Genesis 37, verses 1 to 11. It says this, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Jacob is also known as Israel. He's the guy God changed his name to Israel. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. His father's, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. He was a bit of a snitch. And uh, now Israel, Jacob, that is, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him or a multicolored coat for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. And could not speak a word to him. Just picture that. They, they never spoke to him at all because of their hatred. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers again. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I, sun and moon, and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept this matter in mind. And I just want to read one verse from Joel, the prophet Joel, chapter 2, and it's verse 28. And this is the passage that Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit 
falls after Jesus has been taken to heaven. This is the passage Peter quotes. And it says this, Joel 2, 28, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will dream visions. Uh, Joseph shares his dream to his brothers and he thinks they're going to love it. In fact, he thinks that, that they're going to go to GoFundMe and, and like pay for his dream to come to pass. But actually, the Bible tells us that they'd already hated him and now they hated him all the more. Sometimes you can have a good idea, you can have a dream and you think everybody will love it, don't you? But actually, sometimes you find they don't love it. I love uh, the fact that kids have dreams. Uh, I, I, when I was a kid, I had a dream. When I was eight years old, I was going to be a professional drummer. I had two uncles who were drum, drummers. Um, one who, who I went with every week to practice with his band uh, on a Sunday afternoon in a local pub, in a room in a local pub. And then I had another drummer who was older, and uh, he was a jazz drummer. In fact, he's 78 years old, and he's still got his own jazz trio. It plays around. It's called the Alf Benji Trio, and they're really good. I went to see them the other week. My other, bro- my other uncle, he played more modern music. And uh, because I practiced, they knew I was quite good. At eight years of age, anyway, I was quite good. And they had this concert, this gig, locally. And my uncle persuaded my mum to let me go. Because they thought... We'll bring this eight-year-old kid out to play drums live, and the crowd will love us. And so that's exactly what happened. I arrived at the place. I was allowed to go, and they'd got this gig. And it sent to me like just this huge place. I, I thought I was in the O2 arena, you know. And sure enough, you know, halfway through the set, they invite me up, and I, I play. And of course, for the first time in the whole night, everybody's watching and listening to the band. And I played one song, and I was the hero. And I was like, everybody wanted to talk to me. Everybody wanted to say, well done. Everybody loved the band a lot more, so it had worked for them as, as well. And of course, it wasn't the O2 Arena. It was the British Rail Staff Association Club in Langworth Junction. I went back, actually, about 30 years later, because Nathan was playing football uh, there. And as I, I walked in, I couldn't wait to go back and see the scene of my greatest triumph as a drummer. And I walked in, and I couldn't believe how small it was. It was so. But, you know, sometimes the dreams you start with aren't the dreams you end up with. Sometimes the dreams you start with show up in a, a later time in a different form in a different time, in a different place. It didn't take long for my dream to change. At eight years of age, I wanted to be a professional drummer, maybe playing a band. More likely, I wanted to be a session musician and play with lots of different bands. But at 15, my dream changed. It became different. I started to dream about being the pastor of a church. I started to dream about leading a church that would be fun, a church that people would actually want to go to, a church that would be enjoyable to be a part of, a church that would be relatable to life. I didn't know what that would look like at 15 years of age, but that was, I began to dream. And one thing I discovered about when you have a dream in your heart, a dream will make you bold. It'll make you daring, it'll make you audacious. And and it will also cause you to determine every decision on the basis of that dream. Eugenie and I have done some bold things in our life, some audacious things, but we, they didn't seem bold and audacious because we had a dream. The dream masked the risk. The dream actually covered up. People said to us, you're stupid, you're crazy, you should never, you should never do that. And we thought, no, you're stupid, you're crazy because there's no, there is no risk because I have a dream. Joseph is 17 when he shares his dream with his brothers and they hated him for him. But Joseph still wore his coat. He still, although they didn't speak to him, he still shared his dream. Although his dream was controversial, he was bold. And he was willing to step out and share his dream. And although his father rebuked him, the scripture says that we read, his father kept these things in his heart. His father knew God was up to something. 
You know, he, he, he wore his coat and he told his dreams. Um, and they didn't like him because he was different. He was different because his father loved him more than them. But he was also different because of what he wore and how he carried himself and the things he said. You see, people accept you when you're the same. But they come to respect you when you're different. They accept you when you're the same. And they want you to be the same because it causes them to, to, to feel normal. But actually, they start to respect you when you're different. You know, I, I said about how having a dream uh, transformed the decisions in our lives. And uh, when I met Jeannie, I, I fell in love. Who wouldn't fall in love with Jeannie on the first time you meet her? But I did. I fell in love. But I knew there was a challenge. And the challenge was I had a dream. And I couldn't go out with somebody or marry somebody who couldn't share the dream. And so I remember when I eventually plucked up courage to ask Jeannie to go out with me, she said yes. You know, I said to her, this is the dream. This is where my life's going. I, I knew by then, this is where my life's going. And I'm willing. I was bold. I'm willing to pay whatever price to pursue that dream, even if it fails. I said, and, and, and so I will need you to know that right now, because that's the trajectory of our lives together. If you say yes. And she did say yes, which was so, so good. And so I tried to make it sound worse than that. I said, you know, we'll never have any money. Because I thought if you pursued a dream of serving God, you would be poor. I don't know where I got that from. Well, I do know where I got it from, but that's another message. I, I, and I said, you know, we, we might not have any money. and We might have to live in another country. We may have to live in a mud hut. I was painting the blackest picture I could paint. But of course, Jeannie said, I'm in. I'm in, and the last 30 odd three years of our lives, 34 years of our lives, there, well, however many years of our lives, <laughs> we've done audacious things, we've done bold things, we're still doing them today because I had a dream. Because you see, people want you to be the same, but they respect you when you're different. Uh, you know, like 19 years ago, February 2000, uh, I was offered a job. I was offered a job, and I don't share this story much, but I was offered a job living in Singapore, working in Southeast Asia, including Australia, and the salary they offered me in 2000, 19 years ago, was 100,000 pounds. I obviously didn't take the job. I chose this over that because I had a dream. I've never regretted that decision for one moment in my life. Because a dream will make you bold and a dream will make you different. There are some people who love Icon Church. They like Icon Church because we're different. And, and Icon Church is different. And there's all kinds of differences about us. Some people because our worship may be a bit different. Because, you know, our attitude's a bit different. We've heard the fact we do three services on a Sunday and not one and whatever. Some people like us because of the difference, but sometimes then when they come, they want to make us the same as the church they left. But I believe we have to be confident in who God calls us to be because people respect you when you're different. Just a couple of years ago, somebody said, I love your church and, you know, we feel God calling us to your church. And one of the things we love about it is you're so positive. You're faith-filled. You talk positively all the time because you've got this engine of faith. In it, But when they came to our church, they just wanted us to make us as miserable and as doubting as the church they'd left. You see, a dream will make you bold. And so today I want to challenge us. I want to say to us, let's dream different. Dream different. Uh, there's a song. It's, I don't think it's still in the charts, but it's recently been in the charts called Old Town Road. In fact, I think somebody's done it on this stage this uh, last year. But, you know, they had to take it off the Billboard country music charts because they got complaints that the song wasn't country enough. And so the Billboard charts had this challenge. Where do we put this song? It's distinct. It's a bit different. We can't put it in country. We can't put it in heavy metal. We can't. And so they had this little challenge <clears throat> because it was distinctive. They had nowhere to put it. And I think that we, when we dream different... 
I think sometimes we try to downplay our distinctives. We try to downplay our differences because we just want to be accepted because people accept you when you're the same. But I want to say to us this morning, people respect us when we're different, when we're different. You see, Joseph looked different. He spoke different. And I believe for us as a church, but also for you as an individual, God will show you your unique calling, your unique place, the difference in you. He will do things in you he's not doing in anybody else. He'll call you. He'll tell you. He'll nudge you. And it'll seem uncomfortable because it'll seem different. But when it seems different, remember, you know, people accept you when they're same, but you're there. They respect you when you're different. People want you to downplay your differences. But a dream will make you different. A dream will make you different. Let me think about some of the differences that the dream does in our lives. You know, when you've got that dream, like Joseph had, it makes you different in terms of sacrifice. I don't know, maybe some people, since you've come to Jesus, have said to you something like, well, you're just no fun anymore. Now you're, you're just no fun. You used to get involved in all these jokes. You used to get involved in all this stuff. You used to live like this with us. You're just different. You're just no fun anymore. And we can feel guilty about that. But, you know, I remember people telling me that, you know, years ago and, and saying, you're just no fun anymore. And I thought, well, I'm having the most fun I've ever had. I, I'm actually enjoying what this life is. I'm not miserable. I've not chosen a life of misery. I've actually chosen a life of pursuing a dream and being part of something that God is doing. And I'm having a lot of fun. But a dream will cause you to sacrifice some things. Jeannie said it this morning. If you were in Chesterfield in an area encouraged, she talked about how, you know, at this time of year, September, some things die so that other things can live and grow. And that's a dream. Sacrificing. For it to be different. You know, a dream will give you a different destiny. Joseph, at 17, began to understand because of his dream, he was to have a different destiny than his brothers. And I want to suggest to you, and I feel the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us today, that he is dropping dreams in our hearts because he wants to give us a different destiny, a different future. A destiny that will cause us to see things differently, or cause us to speak th about things differently, cause us to think differently. Yeah. I want to show you this picture. It's actually two pictures together. I've just been in Madrid. I've just been teaching uh, and, and learning with a group of pastors. And we were on the uh, top floor of the hotel in a, in a meeting room. And uh, the side uh, were, uh, was just a, a wall of glass windows. And I just took these photos of what we could see, and this was on the right, and then this was just a little bit later on the left, and obviously I've zoomed in a bit more on the left than I did on the right. But the thing that struck me on those photos were those spires. And that hundreds of years ago, decades ago, millennia ago, people had a different vision. We have to build something for the glory of God. It's got to rise up higher than anything else. It's got to be on the top of a hill like the one on the right. It's got to be seen to be significant. Why? Because they had a different vision. They had a, a vision that was bold. It was daring. And it's going to honor God. You see, because your dream, your different dream, is the door to your destiny. And I thought about those cathedrals and those churches and those places and I thought that people had a vision and their vision was so big they said we've got to do something for the glory of God I believe when we dream differently as Icon Church we won't just be thinking about having fun right here right now we'll be thinking about we need to do something for the glory of God you see what they did hundreds and thousands of years ago is still impacting me today. I didn't get chance, but I love to go in those places and just see the quality of the workmanship, the fact that they had all kinds of artisans working on these buildings, stonemasons, painters, and so on. And, and still today, that is having an impact on people's lives. I believe we've got to dream different. 
We haven't got just to think of our generation or our children's generation or our children's children's generation. I believe we, God is calling us to dream different, to think about doing things that could affect people for hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years. We've got to be that bold. We've got to be that different. You see, a different dream gives you a different plan and a different vision. As we've said, we could just do what everyone else does. All of us could. But I think a dream causes us to be a little bit bold and a little bit daring. And I pray today that the Holy Spirit will put more boldness and more dare in the side of us. We've done some bold and daring and audacious things in our lives. But you don't retire from that. It just gets more adventurous and more exciting. You know, I, I've got some dreams. I've got some dreams for our church. I've I got some dreams around our music. You know, Icon Music, one of the songs we sang this morning here in Chesterfield, Miracle Moment, was written by our creative team. But I've got a dream that our music will bless the world. Yeah. Will actually bless the world. And it's been great to see one or two songs played, you know, and lots of people listening on Spotify and different places places and on different albums and on different playlists etc but I've got a real dream that first of all we will write great music that causes you and I to engage in with God in Icon Church but actually goes way beyond that and like a wave blesses the church around the world I've got a dream that people will be listening to that music in their car in South America in North America in China they'll be listening to that music in those places and they'll sense the presence and the power of God they'll be they'll be listening to you made a way to the miracle moment and something will happen I believe and my dream means that I, I you know at some point I, I we need to bring a crew, one of our creative team, creative pastors, onto our staff. We've got to be that bold and that daring and say we need to create a position where somebody can work on that dream and to see that dream fulfilled. I've got a dream that will stop many things that reach more people. On-ramps, I call them, into the kingdom of God and into the church. On-ramps like, you know, goo, uh, goo play has been an incredible on ramp and Goo Holiday Club has been incredible on ramp. We're going to start Spanish lessons here uh, in in Chesterfield soon, and we see that part of the reason for that is is because we want that to be a place where people could invite people who want to learn Spanish, like me, but other people, <clears throat> and it could be an on ramp to create, connect, and create connection to church for people. And so on. But I would like to create lots and lots of on-ramps. I need a staff person. Yeah. I need somebody who can oversee that. All our staff, we've got small staff really. All our staff, we haven't got enough staff. I need a staff person who can do that. And then we've got our building. Yeah. I really believe we should do something significant. Yeah. And build something significant. We can't build one of those cathedrals. Nobody can build one of those cathedrals. Today, maybe a government could do it. You know, but... but it's just, it's just things, but I believe we should do something significant that people go, wow, wow. They've been daring, bold, audacious, and they have done something for the glory of God. You see, because a, a dream makes us different, because it diff gives us different commitments. You know, there's th three reasons really why people give and the three reasons why people give to something or give their lives to something are uh, fit into these three reasons. The first is the need. And many people do this. Most people, perhaps, we might say do this. I've even noticed people now when it comes to their birthday, they'll say, please, you know, support this charity or please support these people. It's giving to need. Most people. But Jesus told a story one time where this woman is pouring like expensive perfume on his feet. Not even on his face, on his feet. And people start saying, this money, this money could have been given to the poor. This could have been sold. And then Jesus said, hey, hey, you'll always have the poor. You can always give to need. That's what most people do. What this woman is doing is of another level of giving. Most people give to need. 
And that's a good thing. And we should continue to do that. But then the next level of giving is giving to vision. And, and we talked about this in all our churches, in all our locations. But in offering time, I'm, I'm sure today that that's giving to vision. Giving regularly. Giving our tithes and our offerings and bringing commitments that are regular and ongoing. That's giving to vision. So that we can see things move forward. And that's, that's a higher level of giving than giving to need. Jesus said that. But actually, there's another one. And it's giving to honor God. It's giving to see the glory of God move forward. And that's why as a church, we take offerings in all our services, but we also have Rise and Build. And that will be at the end of October this year. You know, we have Rise and Build because that is a time when we can come and give an offering that is God-honoring it's not just giving to need. We'll meet some needs, and we'll talk about that through that offering. We've got to, do, we've got to give to need in that offering. We, we, we'll, we will actually help our vision move forward, yeah. but we're actually going to bring an offering that will glorify God on that time. It's weightier. Yeah. It's weightier. It's more important. I think when we give to honor God, it actually sets us up to create something where people do step back and go, Wow. And people do want to connect with us. You know, when you've got a, a different dream, not only have you got different sacrifice, destiny, vision, and commitment, you also have a different response. Psalm 37 and verse 4 says this, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. I, I believe that one of the most joyful things in life is when you've got a different dream, when you're on a different path, despite its difficulty, despite its challenges, despite its opposition, you're actually pursuing a dream, you're pursuing a destiny, you're pursuing a purpose. And when our dream lines up with God's dream, actually I believe that we can live and delight ourselves in God through those things. And we can know delight and joy and peace and hope. You know, we've just uh, tried to buy some land and, uh, you know, the council didn't give us a uh, change of use and planning permission on that land. But the story's not, not over. And I've heard like some rumors of people saying, oh, will we ever be able to do it? Hey, don't lose hope. Don't, don't, don't lose hope. When you were like, like, hey, let me talk to you. Let me tell you. When you, when you were, watch Roman. Roman is a prophecy for you this morning. Roman blood. I know you can't watch him if you're in Derby or in Sheffield right now. He's learning to walk. He, he's just got the Frankenstein. He's got two steps. Don't lose hope, Roman. Please don't stop trying to walk, Roman. Hey, don't lose hope. We're just trying to walk. We're trying to walk into a dream, into a definite. We need a desperate response. Uh, this morning, I watched him take two steps and Nathan catch him. Uh, and then the, he went the other way, one and a half step. April catch him. I watched that this morning. And this is what I said to him. You're walking. He is not walking. But I prophesied, you're walking. You've made it. We put an application in. It was turned down. We've got a building. Might not, just, might not just be that one. Hey, delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. You have different response and you have a different purpose. At eight years old, I wanted to be a professional drummer. At 17, Joseph thought the dream was all about him. His brothers would bow down. His mum and his dad would bow down and he'd have some prominent position. But 20 years later, at 37, he knew his dream was to save his brothers and to save his mum and dad. It wasn't to rule over them, but to save them. It's a different purpose. And I think when we dream differently, it's not about us. It's about others. I read Joel 2 in verse 28. And at the beginning of Joel 2 and verse 28, it says this, and afterward. After what? Well, Joel's talking about how they're going to face some other nations come and other nations take them captive. But he says, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit, God says on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Anybody glad there's an afterward? 
If we were to say, after what? After what? What does that promise for me look like? It means after your divorce. You can dream a dream and you can see a vision and you can have a future. After you've failed, after your business has gone bust, after you've made a mistake, whatever your, your situation is, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on you, God says. And you will prophesy, you will dream dreams, and you will see visions. Come on, somebody. Come on, and afterwards, after you lose your job, after your, after your enemies have some triumph over you, I will pour my spirit on you, says God. And you'll dream dreams. You see, because God develops the dream in the dark room. For Joseph, it was the pit. It was the slave. It was the prison. And then he became the prime minister. And in the dark room, he learned about the faithfulness of God. You know, we have an Instagram expectation of dreams, don't we? Like, point, click, post. Point, click, post. There it is. Point, click, post. There it is. But God develops our dream in the dark room. And we find in the dark room the faithfulness of God. And toward the end, when 20 years later, when Joseph realizes that this dream is to save his brothers and to save his nation, he says, you meant it for harm. But God meant it for good. He found the faithfulness of God in the pit, as the slave, and as the prisoner. He had faith in God. And it was dark room faith. (laughs) Oh, it's easy to have light room faith. It's it's easy to have when the picture's there. Look, Look at me. Look at the Ferrari I'm driving. That's easy faith. But dark room faith, that's harder. But it's where God develops the dream. Maybe you've got a dream in your, for your family and it's in the dark room. God's developing it. Don't, don't try and make it a Polaroid. No, God's developing dark room. Maybe for your life, for your finances, for your business. Maybe it feels like it's in the dark room right now. That's okay. God's developing the dream. God's developing the dream. He did it in Joseph for 20 years. And when your dream has been developed... Your greatest joy will not be your wealth. It will be what your wealth does for others. That will be your greatest joy. It will not be what your wealth does for you, but it will be what your wealth does for the kingdom of God. Just like Joseph. His greatest joy was not the fact he was now prime minister, but being prime minister of Egypt meant he would save his nation, what it did for others. Your greatest joy will not be your personal happiness, but what your happiness does for others. Your greatest joy will not be the fact that you had a desire and it's been fulfilled. Because if it's just about having desire fulfilled, you'll never be fully happy. You'll just have another desire and another desire and another desire. But you just have desire for more. But your greatest joy will be that when your desire fulfilled serves other people. Chariots of Fire. Anybody remember that film? What was the runner's name? Was it Eric Little? Eric Little. And he was a Christian, of course, and it's a great story uh, 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 about his faith and his story. And he says this, and it's true. He says it in his biography. He says it in the film. When I run, I feel the pleasure of God. Your dream... Whatever that dream is, whether it's for your family, for your business, for your finances, for your health, for your wealth. I believe when that dream blesses others, you will sense the pleasure of God. When that dream, being fulfilled, honors God, contributes to vision, blesses the needs of others, you will sense the pleasure of God. And you will hear the Holy Spirit say, thank you. Thank you. You will hear a whisper. God won't shout. You will hear a whisper. Thank you. And you know why it's a whisper? Because he's close. He doesn't have to shout when he's close. Thank you. 
you will feel his breath. <sighs> Thank you. When your dream, developed in a dark room maybe, just like Joseph, actually blesses others. Psalm 37 tells us this, delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's twofold that give you. It's, he'll give them to us. You, like me, at eight years old, I wanted to be a drummer, but at 15, I got another desire. Somehow God gave me a different desire. He can do that for each and every one of us. He can give us his desire for our lives, but then he can give it to us. <laughs> can actually give it, cause it to happen. This is us. We're dreamers and we dream different. We dream different. I wonder, could we all stand? I want to pray for us. I finished, but I want to pray for us today. And I want to pray for you today. If in your heart you say, I'm willing to be different. Maybe you're stood in Sheffield. Maybe you're stood in Sutton or Derby today. And you're saying, you know, Paul, I, I'm willing to dream different. I'm willing for a different plan. I'm willing for a different desire, a different vision, for different com commitments. I, I, I don't just want to dream like everybody dreams for themselves, but I'm willing to dream for a different purpose, a bigger purpose. I'm willing to dream God's dream. I'm going to pray for you right now, and then we're just going to worship, and then I'm going to come back and pray again. Father, I pray for us right now in this moment. Some of us right now are in the dark room, sensing you developing something, sensing you building things in our lives. And we, our declaration today is we are willing to have a different dream, a different plan, a different desire, a different vision, just not what everyone else has, but to dream for a different purpose. We are willing, God, today to have God's dream in our hearts and in our lives and to pursue the things you have for us we want to say that individually, but today we also want to say it as Icon Church. Our goal is not to be like everybody else. Our goal is to be who you've made us. This is us. We're willing to dream. The impossible dream. In Jesus' name, amen. again I'm going to pray for us this morning and we're saying you know I'm willing to have a different commitment I'm willing to step up my commitment whether that's serving or whether that's giving I'm not going to be a person who just gives to need but I'm going to be a person that causes things to move forward and to go forward but also I'm going to do something that causes the glory of God to be seen I, maybe you don't know what that looks like. Maybe we don't know what that looks like. But when our heart is open, God can show us. And God can speak to us. And so, Father, I pray for us today. I pray that you will make us people who step forward in our commitments of serving, of giving. Not just so that we meet needs. Not just so that the lights can be turned on, but so that vision can go forward. But most importantly, that God would be praised and God would be glorified. And that in years to come, in 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100, a thousand years from now, people will say, you remember those icon people? This is here today because of them. We, Father God, we ask you, step us forward, move us forward. In the power of Jesus' name, I pray. I will believe like I've already seen it. God of the impossible.
God's about to do something new. He's about to do something that transforms our future as a church. And I think that's true for individuals here to take us further, to open new doors, doors that have been closed and doors that look closed. They're just new opportunities. They're just new opportunities. Land that hasn't been given, that's just as an opportunity for us to find the right land and the right place. And when God does it, that dream, that dream will bring honor and glory to Him. But that dream will touch many, many lives. I believe God's heart, God's passion is that somehow in our church and through our church, we find ways. We find ways not just for our music, not just for for on-ramps, as I've called them, of ministry so that we can touch many others, but that thousands and thousands of lives are touched by God. I'm simply going to say thank you. We're going to hear thank you. But I'm going to say thank you, Lord. Thank you that that's about what you're about to do with us. We believe for it, Father God, in Jesus' name. In Sheffield, in Derby, in Sutton, in Chesterfield, in London too. I've not mentioned London till now. But in London too. Father God, we pray, touch many lives. Touch others. It will be our greatest joy when we see the stories of transformation, of hope, of healing, of salvation. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Come on, if you, if you agree with me, why don't you give God some praise as I, these guys leave.